Hello and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 Vaccine Messaging for Cultural Orientation. We are going to go ahead and get started. And uh, my name is Jamie Bussey. I am the Deputy Director for CORE, and I'm joined by our Senior Training Coordinator, Minar Marouf, and we'll be facilitating today's session along with members of the National Resource Center for Refugees, Immigrants, and Migrants, or as you might know them, NRC RIM. Uh, we will introduce them momentarily, but first we wanted to spend some time reviewing what to expect during today's session and the Zoom features we'll be using. So about today's session, uh, you may have already noticed, uh, but we are uh, recording today's session and we will be providing a recording and the resources that are shared through our learning platform after the session. Um, that will take a couple days to do, um, but you will receive an email when it, those things are ready for you to review. Now, during today's session, it is an hour and a half, we will be taking a three minute break uh, in the middle. And the final piece of today's session is that we really wanna highlight that this, your participation matters. And with that, we wanna spend some time reviewing the Zoom features um, so that we can ensure maximum participation. So we are using Zoom webinar today instead of Zoom meeting. And so some of the features are maybe a little bit different than what you're used to. Um, the first thing that we'll be using uh, in today's session is the raise your hand feature. Um, this can be found at the bottom of your screen or sometimes your menu may be at the top of the screen under reactions. Um, and you'll see a little icon for raise your hand. So to test to see uh, that you found the icon, I'd like you to raise your hand if you have attended a core webinar before. All right, so if you can raise your hand if you've attended a core webinar before, and I'm seeing many familiar names in the uh, attendees box, which is great. Um, so nice to see um, those names. I wish I could see your faces, but still nice to see your names. So it looks like um, I have about 35 of you who found the, um, raise your hand feature, which is great. So we'll use that again uh, later in the session. In addition to the raise your hand feature, we're also going to be using the chat feature. Um, so you'll see this again on the bottom menu. Um, and the chat feature is really going to be useful when we're doing activities where we're going to ask you questions um, for you to respond in there. Um, so to see if we all can find the chat feature, I'd like you to chat um, where you're located. So if you, oh, and the other thing to note about this, sorry, real quick, when you go to chat, we want to make sure you select all panelists and attendees, okay? So you want to um, select all under two, all panelists and attendees. Um, so I'd love for you to chat where you're calling in from so we can, everybody can get a sense of the room. Uh, it looks like we have some people from New Jersey, Nairobi, te Texas, Austria, Maryland, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, New York, Jordan, um, really great Ukraine, Indiana, California, Pennsylvania, Iraq, uh, lots of different people. Um, so really in great company, Florida. So thank you everybody um, for using the chat. We really appreciate it. Okay, the next feature we're gonna be using is, um, you'll notice that there's a feature called, uh, it's the Q&A and um, this feature is also at the bottom of the screen. Um, and the Q&A feature, I just wanna kind of highlight the difference of this between the chat, right? And if you get the two mixed up, it's okay. Um, so the Q&A feature, we're gonna be really using um, to answer questions. So we have reserved time during the session to answer questions. Um, and so if you have questions about content or how to you know, answer a certain question or, or that type of thing, you can put that in the question and answer. And what's really nice about the Q&A um, is that we have enabled um, an upvoting system. So that means that if someone poses a question and you also have that same question, you can vote that you want that question answered and that helps us to prioritize. We are gonna do our best to get to all the questions, um, but if we don't, we are going to um, follow up with those um, in the post-webinar resources. All right, so those are the three uh, three features. The final feature, uh, which many of you may be familiar with, is the poll feature. Um, and for this, um, normally uh, what's supposed to happen is a, a poll question will pop open on your screen and you'll be prompted to answer that question. Uh, and then we'll wait for all the participants. My goal is to have at least 70% of the answers before we close the poll. Um, so I will be providing that, okay, we have about 50% and some uh, nudging 
wanting to make sure we have everybody's uh, participation. So we're actually going to go ahead and do the uh, use the poll feature first. Um, and I want to start the session by doing a bit of a temperature check. Um, and so on the screen, what you'll see is the uh, following statement. I am confident answering questions about the COVID-19 vaccine during cultural orientation. Um, and Manar is going to go ahead and launch that poll for us. And you're going to pick on a scale of one to five where you feel your confidence is. One being not very confident and five being very confident. Um, so I'm already seeing some of those uh, answers coming in. So I'm going to give you some time to respond. Um, you guys are already off to a great start with your participation. I already have about 65% of the votes. So we're going to give another 15 seconds um, for you guys to respond to that poll question. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll and we're going to share the results. Um, and so you'll see that we have uh, about a good mix, actually. We have a range of individuals. A lot of you are following in the three range, which is great. Um, some people feel more confident and others are not confident. And that's that's amazing. So we're hopefully by the we're going to come back to this question at the end and hopefully we can increase some confidence um, as a group. Um, so thank you so much for those responses. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is the objectives for the session. But to do this, we want to ask another poll question and we want to get a sense of what you're expecting to learn today. Um, so again, we'll launch another poll quickly um, and you'll see on the screen. What do you expect to learn today? Um, and you want to select uh, across um, these different choices. So A is access uh, in language resources for cultural orientation. Are you expecting to be able to respond to mis misinformation? Uh, are, you, uh, are you looking to answer questions about vaccine choice? navigating answer, answering technical questions about COVID-19 vaccine, or are you um, expecting to have effective strategies for managing COVID-19 vaccine questions during cultural orientation? All right, so um, some great responses. This should be a select multiple, um, so you should be able to choose more than one, and I'm seeing a lot of great responses in here so far. I'm going to give about 15 more seconds um, for everybody to answer this question. Great, let's go ahead and um, close the poll and we'll go ahead and share the results again. And I'll just recap these in case you're on the phone. Um, so it looks like uh, almost 80% of you are really looking to walk away with effective strategy for managing COVID-19 vaccine questions, which is great. We're um, the later part of the session, we're gonna do some scenarios and role plays, um, which we hope you'll be able to glean a lot of insights for. And we're really gonna encourage you that your learning doesn't stop with this hour and a half, right? This uh, hour and a half is probably not nearly enough time to go through all the different scenarios that could happen during cultural orientation. Um, so we're going to give you a taste of some of the things that you can do, and we're really encouraging you to continue to practice with your um, co-workers and colleagues after this session. Uh, the other areas um, that people are looking for are um, the second one was responding to mis misinformation, answering technical questions, and those are all kind of blended through our resources um, that we're going to talk about, and we're also going to use those in the scenarios as well. All right, so thank you um, for those responses. Um, and so let me just recap again the objectives so we're all on the same page. Um, so we want the objectives, the first one is to find and access tools and resources on updated messaging specific for CO providers around COVID-19 um, and the vaccine. So that's our first part and we'll be moving into that section momentarily. The next part uh, objective of this session is that we want you to have at least two to three best practices on answering clients commonly asked questions. Um, and these best practices are framed um, around making sure we're reinforcing safety, dignity, and agency for those that we're working with. Um, and the last one is that we want you to practice how to answer questions during cultural orientation about um, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Um, specific to misinformation, technical question, and making choices on the vaccine. So those are our objectives for today, and those um, align with the, the previous question around expectations. All right, so what I'd like to do, the main facilitator is not going to be me. I know I've been talking uh, quite a bit already, um, but we actually have with us um, 
three uh, individuals from NRC RIM. Um, we have with us uh, Sarah Clark, um, and I'm going to introduce each of these and give you a little bit about their background. So Sarah Clark is the uh, technical advisor for health promotion with IRC. She's a global health consultant. She's worked um, for organizations in the United States, the Netherlands, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Mali. Um, she is also the coordinator for the Society of Refugee Healthcare Providers and the co-organizer of the U U.S. North American Refugee Health Conference. Her most recent work includes program manager for a team investigating COVID-19 outbreaks in um, the Southern Alberta's meat packing plants. Um, she has a master's of science in public health um, from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a certificate in global mental health, um, trauma and recovery from the Harvard program in refugee trauma. In addition to Sarah, we also have with us Allison Wu. Uh, is, she is the project and operations senior coordinator for the program quality and innovation department at the IRC. As a public health professional, she's worked in the United States, the Republic of Congo, and Egypt um, in areas including health systems, strengthening humanitarian policy research, and community health outreach. Uh, prior to the IRC, uh, Allison worked as a consultant for the World Health Organization, uh, regional office for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, researched, uh, uh, did research humanitarian development peace nexus, and she has a master's of public health in health management and a concentration in humanitarian studies, ethics and human rights from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, last but not least, of course, we also have with us Lena Zara. Uh, is, she is a project and operations senior coordinator as well for the IRC. Uh, Lena is a Syrian American social impact strategist. She has a master's in international development and humanitarian emergencies from the London School of Economics and Political Science with a specialization in highlighting issues and shifting the narrative for globally displaced persons uprooted due to humanitarian crises. She's worked uh, with small to large scale um, nonprofits, NGOs, social justice coalitions, and government agencies like the World Food Program, IRC UK, um, and the US Senate. So obviously, we're super lucky and grateful to have um, these three um, individuals with us today, um, bringing their wealth of experience. So as I mentioned, the first part of our session, we're gonna spend some time going over what resources are available to help you address COVID-19 vaccine messaging for cultural orientation. Um, now you may be asking, how much am I expected to cover about COVID-19 as a part of cultural orientation? And over the past year, you have all done a wonderful job of incorporating basic messaging about transmission and prevention of COVID-19 as a part of CO, both um, pre-departure and post-arrival. And this same approach holds true as we move into the vaccination phase. The expectation is that general messaging about the COVID-19 vaccine is incorporated into cultural orientation as a part of the health section. Um, and this is not to say that you alone are responsible for delivering these messages. This is all a part of the um, resettlement process. And depending on where you are, you'll have other um, aspects of your org organization assisting with delivering these messages. We also want to acknowledge that this messaging, like most messaging around COVID-19, is evolving and really based on your given uh, context. Um, so this is also why visiting and accessing the resources that we're sharing today um, ongoingly are gonna be critical to your work. And with that, let's take a look at those available resources. Um, so to do this, I'm going to set up this activity and then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. We are going to use the raise your hand feature, which we uh, tested out earlier. Um, and so what is going to happen is we're going to ask you to raise your hand if you have used a specific resource on the page. Um, and there's no worries if you haven't. We're just trying to get a temperature check. And then uh, we'll go over a little bit about what's on in that resource and we'll share that resource in the chat and as i mentioned we'll also share it after the session so with that i'll go ahead and turn it over to sarah thanks jamie so please raise your hand if you've accessed the nrc rim get the facts vaccine campaign and as jamie said it's okay if you haven't yet but if anyone has and i'll give a few moments for people to find the raised hands. All right, so it looks like we have some people, only a handful of people have had a chance to access it yet, which is great because I'm going to walk through a bit um, about what the resource is exactly. 
So for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at this, it's guidance from the CDC that NRC RIM adapted about the COVID-19 vaccine. And then they created educational materials in over 30 languages to try to address the most common questions and concerns that we were hearing from refugee and immigrant communities about the COVID vaccine in a less complicated, less full of medical jargon way. So it covers facts about, you know, the vaccine side effects, ingredients, how much does it cost, who's eligible. It's available in many different formats for different learners and literacy levels, such as social media graphics, audio recordings, and flyers. And I think most important to these materials is that they've been approved by community reviewers who are bilingual, bicultural, members of different communities, um, and they've approved them for cultural and linguistic appropriateness. So you might find these materials helpful to give to your CO participants, especially if they have questions about the vaccine or any concerns. Let's go now to the second resource. So again, please raise your hand if you've had a chance to visit the NRC RIM Translated Materials Library. And I see some people have, so far about nine of you. I'll give it a few more moments. All right, so again, it looks like a handful of you have had a chance. And for those who have not, I'm just gonna walk through it again briefly. This is the most popular part of the NRC RIM website. And so NRC RIM has been collecting any and all resources related to COVID, especially those that are in different languages or have been developed specifically for refugee, immigrant, and migrant communities. At last count, the library had over 6,300 resources, which is incredible, in 100 languages. And again, they've tried to collate different formats, such as video or audio recordings or posters. You can filter by various search terms, such as resource type. Um, and you might want to take a look at this if you have CO participants who ask you for materials about a specific COVID topic. You might take a look here first and see if you can find what they're looking for. I'll now turn it back to CORE for the last resource. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. So for the last one, um, let me go ahead and I'm gonna lower all your hands so we can get a, a, a accurate count. Um, and we have, uh, you have reviewed CORE and NRC RIMS COVID-19 FAQ page. So please raise your hand if you've reviewed this resource. And again, it's okay. We're hoping that uh, part of this is that you'll be able to go back to these and access them afterward, um, maybe find some useful tips as uh, Sarah said to share with, um, with uh, the individuals you're working with. All right, so I see we have about 13. So I'm gonna go back to the screen share um, and show you um, this resource. So this was developed in collaboration with NRC RIM. Um, and so we've had this page previously, the Refugee Resettlement During COVID-19 FAQ. We launched it last year, um, but now it's been updated to include, include um, vaccine messaging. And, and apologies, I'm looking over here because that's where the screen is for me. Um, but you'll see on here, um, there's some helpful tips about how to um, work with um, uh, participants during cultural orientation. And some of these tips is uh, Sarah is going to go into. So I'm going to go you know, I'm not going to go through these tips right now. Sarah's going to share about those. But you'll see in here frequently asked questions. Um, so, for example, how did they make and approve the vaccine so quickly? And this has a curated answer, and it also has specific resources tied to this question. So this has really been designed specifically for those who are providing cultural orientation. Um, but it, a lot of it is referring back to resources on NRC RIM. Um, so again, all three of these resources we hope will be very valuable as you're delivering cultural orientation. All right, so with that, I'm actually gonna turn it back over to Sarah and we're gonna do a little bit of a knowledge check with you um, and kind of ask you to take a look at the last link that Minar has posted, which is the refugee resettlement during COVID FAQ um, to answer some questions. Thanks, Jamie. 
So staying on the FAQ page, like Jamie said, we're going to ask you a few questions and you can navigate to that web page to find the question and answer if you want, or you can um, try to do your best guess. The first question is, will I be eligible to receive the vaccine in the U.S. upon arrival if I can't get it before I leave? And your answer options are yes, anyone can be vaccinated regardless of immigration status, or no, only if you are a U.S. citizen. And Jamie, I can't see when the poll is. Um, oh, we're, we're at about 56%. Okay. So uh, we'll give another 10 seconds. We have a, a very, um, we have some uh, top students in the, in, the room, in, the, in the virtual room with us. Nice. All right, we'll go ahead and close that poll. And then we'll uh, share the results. Wow, that was too easy of a question for you all. Good job. So yes, 100% of you have said yes, you can, anyone can be vaccinated regardless of immigration status. Next question. Is the COVID vaccine halal? Your answer choices are yes. It has received the approval from lots of Muslim religious leaders, scholars, and organizations, or no, it has not been confirmed. All right, this one was a little bit trickier, but the answer is yes. It has received approval from many different Muslim religious leaders, scholars, and organizations that it is halal. And in the Q&A, we can go into a little bit more about why that is, if there's interest. And again, on the core FAQ web page, there, there are some examples of the types of organizations who've approved it and also some videos that you can watch or send to clients. So next, we would love to hear from you. I know you guys wrote down some of your challenges when you first registered for the webinar, but so that everyone can see, we'd love if you can type in the chat and remember to select all panelists and attendees and let us know what challenges have you had answering questions about the COVID-19 vaccine during CO. And then I believe Jamie and Minar are gonna write it for us up on the screen. Correct. What you write in the chat. I see community feedback and rumors, timing it with school vaccine, responding to myths, that's a big one. Worries about the vaccine affecting fertility, we've heard that a lot. Will my family be forced to get the vaccine? Uncertain about knowing what to share at pre-departure CO. How to address clients' deeply held beliefs when it comes to religion affirming 100% effectiveness. Many clients believe the vaccine is a scam. Vaccines contradict religious beliefs, lack of trust, the different brands, what if you get sick, the myths. So yes, these are definitely all challenges that we've been hearing from other client facing staff, such as you know case managers, employment specialists, and so forth. And I appreciate that it's very tough for everyone to be on top of how rapidly changing COVID is and also trying to deliver CO and cover all the topics you need to cover. We hope by the end of our presentation today that you'll feel better equipped to address some of these challenges that you mentioned in the chat. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Lena, who is going to talk with you about some of the tips for addressing these challenges. Thank you, Sarah. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit, um, just very briefly, the importance on what we share and, and how we share it to give you the kind of context which will help uh, with our role play scenario. So it's important to know that refugees and other forcibly dis displaced persons may have had lived experiences um, or family history that in might include medical experimentation or unethical medical practice. Um, this is also true for many people of color in the United States. Um, in addition, there are, um, there are instances where certain negative influencers may spread disinformation, so intentionally manufactured um, incorrect information um, to sow discord and distress in a community. 
Many examples uh, include, um, but are not limited to pharmaceutical experimentation in the global south. Uh, in addition to the Tuskegee experimentation that focused on African Americans in 1932, we've actually seen forced sterilization of Native Americans and African Americans as recently as the late 1970s. So with that context, it's also important then to understand there can be hesitancy in the community, um, but also to different degrees. Um, and many of the reasons are the same to, to lesser or more extent. Um, this could be, which many of you have already stated, worried about the side effects, getting sick, is it affect uh, and alter my DNA and infertility? Uh, is it safe? So it's really important to know why and the reasoning behind, um, and understandably so, uh, that many individuals in the community might be hesitant. Um, some individuals um, have even expressed you know, concern about uh, having the vaccine be tested on um, persons or people of color first, or that they might not be getting uh, the same vaccines or the not good vaccines. Uh, so to which people have uh, believed things or have this acceptance or hesitancy um, is really important to know, but also highly variable, which is also important to keep in mind as well. So given this, uh, there is an understandable suspicion of the vaccine and the motivations behind it. What we can do, what IRSF, IRC staff can do, is approach the, the myths, uh, misinformation, and, and disinformation compassionately and, and really with the intent to equip people to seek out accurate information um, for credible sources so that individuals, so that families can make the best decision for themselves. So on this next slide, so before my other colleague Allison will go uh, into kind of a way to, to capture this, we wanted to, to provide a few tips on, on how to approach the conversation, which many of you also expressed you'd like to, to have some strategies about. It's really important to note that the role of resettlement staff, in, including cultural orientation providers, is to ensure that clients have accurate information from trusted sources so that they have an avenue for addressing um, questions, um, concerns, so again, that individuals can make an informed decision um, that's best for themselves and their family. It's important to really keep in mind our role is not to convince um, and absolutely not to force clients that they have to um, or that they need to get the vaccine. With that in mind, uh, it's also important to, to stay comfortable and, and stay within your knowledge base. If you don't know the answer to a client's question that's more than okay, um, consider connecting the client to linguistically accurate information um, from trusted and vetted sources so that, and or, uh, if you don't have the answer, um, telling the clients that you will get back to them with those um, specific um, and distinct resources. And lastly, let, let individuals know that these questions and concerns, have them be encouraged and have them know that these are um, normal and that you want uh, to be able to provide the accurate information uh, from credible sources so that they can make the best decision um, for themselves. On the next slide, just a few more uh, quick tips before I hand it off to Allison. Um, it's also important to note that a client could potentially have incorrect information um, and that's okay, but to we really encourage you to not um, come back to them in a way saying that they are wrong. The response is most likely to be unproductive and, and discounts what might be an understandable hesitancy. Instead, we, we really wanna encourage you all to empower individuals pointing them to trusted and accurate and uh, credible sources so that they can make their own informed decision. When countering misinformation, it's really important to also to not repeat it. And it, this can be very difficult, but studies have shown um, that when repeating mis and misinformation, even with back checking or discounting it, it actually increases the chance that individuals are gonna remember that myth or misinformation. So instead, repeat what you know to be facts and bolster those with accurate information from trusted sources. And, and lastly, make sure any information, uh, it's of course, 
as important to what you share, but how you share it. So please make sure um, with the uh, with the resources available, um, consulting anyone that you need to, any additional um, sources to make sure that we can get um, information in the client's preferred uh, and most comfortable language, and impossible and when possible, providing in a variety of formats print, audio, visual, um, to really accommodate to different learning styles and, and literacy levels, um, as well as the appropriate method of distribution. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand off uh, this next portion to Alice, we'll, which will go over a, a very, I think, fun way to remember all of this, which can be a lot. So Alison, take it away. Thanks, Lena. So yeah, as Lena mentioned, um, we thought that, you know, it might be, there are just a lot of tips to remember and we thought it might be good to come up with an acronym um, to kind of summarize uh, the, some of the tips. And so um, here's our acronym NORTH, which stands for Normalize Open-Ended Resources Together and Honest. Um, we thought that this would be a kind of actionable framework for you to frame your responses. Um, um, during the vaccine conversation. So for N, uh, normalize, um, that stands for, you know, assuring clients that it is normal to have these questions and concerns. And so really validating uh, clients and building that trust and ensuring that there's open conversation uh, through normalization. O uh, for open-ended, for certain situations, it might be good to ask open-ended questions to better understand concerns or to um, understand, you know, where clients um, are getting uh, information from so that you can uh, find the resources that would be most applicable. And so like Lena mentioned, you know, if a client sh does share incorrect information, don't correct them, but also avoid repeating the misinformation. Um, for our resources, uh, so share resources from trusted, reputable sources. Um, feel free to refer back to, you know, any of the resources that Jamie and Sarah shared earlier, the core FAQ, um, you know, they're all available uh, for use. And so T for together, um, work together um, with the client. So it's, it isn't your job to convince anyone to get the vaccine. Instead, you know, you should be working together to ensure that the client has enough in the information that they need to make the best decision for themselves and their families. And finally, H for honest. So um, be honest. Um, it is, we welcome everyone to share personal experiences and or reasons why you chose to get the vaccine, if that's something that you're comfortable with. Also, you know, it's okay not to, there can be, you know, the, the COVID context is always evolving and it's definitely okay not to know um, answers to all of the questions. And so um, if that's really the case, um, you can always offer to help look for resources uh, together with the client. I'm going to pass it back over to Jamie. Great. Thank you so much. So um, we are doing really great on time, which means that we are going to break a, a little bit earlier than halfway, um, but we're gonna go ahead and take a three minute break and let you digest what we've covered so far. Um, as you can see on the screen, research shows that breaks can improve your ability to process and retain information, help you stay more focused, um, improve your productivity, and it gives your eyes a break from the screen. So we're gonna um, do a three minute break. I'm gonna put a timer up for three minutes um, and then we'll come back. And when we come back, we're gonna um, transition um, you know, we've covered the resources, we've talked about tips, and now we're actually going to go into the practice portion of the session. Um, so we're going to start that three minutes now, um, and we you'll hear the timer go off, and we'll be back after three minutes. All right, so the break is over. Hopefully you guys got a nice little stretch in. Uh, I did put up the, the north slide because I think there were some individuals who were taking notes. Um, but we are going to go ahead and proceed with the second part of our session. Um, so I'm going to set this up and then I'm going to be transitioning it back over to uh, Sarah, Lena, and Allison to lead us through this at these series of activities. So for the next part of the session, also before I explain this, let me do a check to make sure everybody's back. Can you raise your hand if you are back in the room and back from your break? Let me just get a sense of everybody's with us. Awesome. And we 
have many of you with us. Just show me, raise your hand so I know that you're here. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. I just want to make sure I'm not talking to an empty virtual room, as it were. So, um, all right. So for the next part of the session, we're going to be spending some time looking at some scenarios and conducting role plays. Um, and NRC, Rim, as it says, is going to be leading us through this part. And we've actually had some individuals um, volunteer as a part of this during the registration process. Um, so we're really grateful for those individuals who are going to help do some of these role plays. Um, so I want to take a moment before we go into this um, and really acknowledge that role plays can be super challenging um, and that we're in this space where you guys can't really see one another. Um, and there's a lot of people in the room with this. There's uh, over 100 people on the call. Um, and so we really want to make sure we're acknowledging that the challenge of doing this, but that these role plays are meant to be informative and create teachable moments for all of us. So I'm hoping that you all feel comfortable and we're all very respectful um, and grateful for those who are volunteering. Um, last week, uh, Manar and I actually practiced doing these role plays with Allison, Lena, and Sarah, and we were like, wow, th these are really tough to kind of do on the spot. Um, but we hope that that is um, a really great learning moment for all of us. Um, so the goal is to practice, and it's okay if we're not getting everything right. Um, and as I said, after the session, we're really encouraging you to practice these role plays again so you get more comfortable. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Allison. I see you queued up, so I think you um, um, you guys are going to take over from here. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. And as Jamie mentioned, these role plays really are, they really are meant to be practiced. And we know it can be really tough in the moment to think of a response, especially because clients have such a wide range of questions. So for this first scenario, I'm going to read through it. And then um, Allison and Lena are going to do this first role play. And as you listen to the role play, I'd like you to think back to the NORTH acronym that we shared with you and consider what techniques that Lena, who is acting as the CO provider, what techniques she's using effectively to address Allison, the client's questions. So the first scenario is, you are covering the topic of health as part of pre-departure cultural orientation. A participant asks if she and her children will be forced to receive the vaccine in the United States and how it might affect her employment. Next, we're gonna talk about health and health services in the United States. Any questions before I move on? Yes, I do have a question. Um, I don't feel comfortable with COVID-19 uh, and the COVID-19 vaccine. I'm worried that my children and I will be forced to have the vaccine when we get to the United States. If I refuse, will I still be able to work? So those are great questions. I'm so glad you asked. We've been hearing this a lot. I hear your concerns, you're not comfortable with the vaccine. Our role is to ensure that you have the trusted credible and scientific resources um, and sources of information about the vaccine that you need in order to make the best decision for you um, and your family. Again, it's a personal choice. The vaccine not only helps protect um, you and I, it'll help protect your family and your loved ones. When you get to the US, you will decide if you wanna get the vaccine. Now, in regards to working, that will very much depend on your employer. What you can do is when you get to the US um, is to ask, um, bring this up with your case manager as you're, looking for, as you're looking for the job. Now for the safety of you and others, some employers might ask you to get the vaccine. I know everyone has a lot of questions about the vaccine and we really appreciate those questions. So I also wanna make sure that you receive other helpful health information before you leave for the US. If anyone has more questions, please see me at the end of class. Here's a flyer in your preferred language. Um, if that's okay, let's move on to the next session, um, but we'll definitely get back to those questions and resources that you need. Thank you, Lena and Allison. Next, we'd like to invite you to type in the chat and please don't forget to select all panelists and attendees so that all the attendees can see your response too. But what techniques did you hear as you listen to Lena respond to Allison's question? Sh 
She validated her concerns. She normalized, yep, yeah, she normalized asking the question. She was honest, she shared trusted resources. Offered resources. She covered the North technique. She asked open ended questions. She worked together with the clients. She's suggesting that they work together. Validated her concerns and was realistic about what details she could provide versus not so that the client could manage her expectations. Provided general information because no details, um, the details are unknown. Provided more information in her preferred language. Assured that all questions will be answered after class. That's a good one too, especially if you need to move on to the rest of your CO section and just assuring people that you can be available at the end of class to have a longer discussion. Shared information, she didn't convince the client to get the vaccine. That's another good technique of, despite um, the client saying she wasn't comfortable and wants to refuse, she didn't get into the details around that, just shared um, how the client can get more information. I'll give it one more moment. I'm seeing lots of normalized, sharing validated resources. Honest, reassuring tone. Yes, that's another thing when you're reading through the core FAQ document is you don't have to worry about memorizing those responses or reading it like a script. We do encourage you to kind of adapt it to your own tone and manner of speaking and who you're speaking with too. And above all, to be reassuring to people that you're happy to answer these questions. There are no silly questions. She was empathetic, acknowledging the need of a vaccine in the US for job-related safety, assuring transparent and open, gave her a positive feeling about her concern and her fear is normal. Thank you guys. You all did a wonderful job of writing down some of these techniques. Now we're gonna move on to the next scenario. And so for this one, I'm going to read the scenario We'll give you two minutes to think about how you personally would respond in this situation, and you might want to write down some notes to yourself. Then we're going to call on one of our brave volunteers who's going to help us demonstrate the role play. So the scenario is you are delivering cultural orientation, and after a short break, a participant says that during the break, the interpreter told him that the vaccine can alter your DNA or make it so that you can't have children. And the participant is asking you, is this true, what the interpreter said? So let's take the next two minutes to write down some notes to yourself of how would you answer or what would you say or do in this situation? And I think Jamie is going to set the timer for us. Correct. I'm going to have the timer on the other screen so you guys can see the scenario. Um, but the two minutes are starting now. And Gardenia is going to be our first volunteer. So when the, two, when the two minutes are up, I will go ahead and unmute her. Um, but we'll do the two minutes first. All right, so you've had two minutes. Um, Gardenia is our brave uh, volunteer. So Gardenia is gonna be um, the CO provider in this scenario. Um, and so it's gonna be a real role play. And I can't remember, is it Allison? Uh, are you the one who's going to yeah. be the client? Okay, so Allison's gonna be the client. So Allison, do you wanna, uh, we're gonna pretend that it's after break and uh, mm -hmm. Allison will start the role play Gardenia and then you'll respond. As the role play is happening as the participants, we want you to listen. And if you took notes, note which techniques you matched. Um, and then afterward, uh, we'll do um, a discussion um, with uh, NRC RIM on what happened. All right, are we good? 
So Gardenia, um, I just heard from my interpreter that the COVID-19 vaccine can alter my DNA and make it so that I can't have children. Um, is this true? Thank you, Alison, for the question. I think it's uh, very uh, normal that we hear a lot of things regarding the vaccine and we are unsure of what is right and what's not. Um, so what I would do is that I would um, like to give you this information, this link, and um, this flyer as well. So you can actually read about this um, subject um, and you can read all about if it's, uh, this is true or not. And um, I will have you read it. And if you are done, you can come back to me with questions. And as a side note, I will also talk to the interpreter because I think he's uh, trespassing his role as an uh, interpreter. And also, I'm, I'm sorry for the noise. <laughs> um, thanks for the resources. Um, I, it's not just the interpreter. I've also heard the same thing from friends um, and I've seen people talk about it online. You know, if it isn't true, why are so many people saying the same thing? Sure, I, I understand your point. I think that, as I told you, it's very, um, it's very early for us. Sorry, it's very early for us uh, to have all of the information regarding the vaccine because it has been a very short time. So of course, a lot of people have questions, a lot of people have uh, a lot of fears regarding the vaccine. So it's normal that we have all this information. It's important that we take um, a step and uh, actually read about it and, and uh, trust our sources so we are sure. And we can also help others that maybe have the same questions um, have a better understanding of this. Thank you. Thank you, Gardenia, very much for that wonderful role play. I'm going to walk through, um, you guys were writing down at home, like some of the techniques that Gardenia used that matched maybe with what you had written down, and I'm going to go through some things. So Gardenia, you did a really, really great job of normalizing Allison's questions. Like you said, thank you, and you said it's normal, we're hearing lots of questions like this you pointed her to more resources. You talked about giving her a flyer and a link so that she could read more about the topic. You made her, the way you responded and your tone was very reassuring and you definitely emphasized, you know, that if she has questions, you guys can work on it together. Like she can come back to you after she's done some self learning. If she has follow up questions, she can come to you. And you also did a good job of not repeating the misinformation that she had heard. You focused it very generally on, you know, there's a lot of information out there, some of it accurate and not accurate. Um, just some tips for in the future. I think the interpreter piece is really tricky because likely the interpreter is still there and is interpreting what you are saying to the client. And so I think um, another way to approach it instead of emphasizing that the interpreter was wrong is you can reframe it to say something about, you know, you can tell that the client, Allison, and the interpreter, you know, really care about the safety of their families and that they're trying to gather all the facts and just talk about how there's a lot of information out of there, um, some of it factual and some of it not, and that it's really important to go to trusted resources. Also, if you feel comfortable, you can name some of the facts which are outlined in the COVID, uh, the core back document where you can talk about how the currently approved vaccines were tested on, you know, tens of thousands of individuals of different ethnicities, ages, and health conditions, and they've met high scientific standards for safety and effectiveness. And you can talk about how many doses of COVID have been given out so far in the U.S. Um, and that the safety is being closely monitored. Another note about the interpreter is I would recommend that 
after the session is over to have a post-session talk with the interpreter and just uh, go over again the guidelines for roles. And if you need access to some of those resources, CORE has a lot of great resources about how to work with interpreters. But I would I would stay away from correcting the interpreter in the moment and instead do it in the post session where you have a conversation with them about you appreciate that they're concerned about the vaccine and are worried for the client, but that it's not within their role as an interpreter to talk about that. And then for future CO sessions, you might consider having a pre-session with the interpreters where you outline what the expectations are for their interpretation and specifically mention anything around the COVID vaccine if you see that that's coming up a lot. Alrighty, we're going to move on to the next section. So again, oh, and thank you again, Gardenia, for such a wonderful job. It was amazing. So the next scenario, it's going to be the same thing. I will read it and then we'll give you two minutes to reflect how would you respond in this scenario. And then we'll call up our next volunteer to go through the role play. And as they, we do the role play, you can star what in the role play matches with what you had written down. And for our next volunteer, we have Johnson. Uh, and I will be unmuting you, Johnson, and we'll go through the same um, situation. So I'm going to start a two minute timer now. Thanks. And so it's you have 15 minutes left in cultural orientation to cover some more information on US laws. When a participant starts going off topic, sharing with the other participants how he doesn't think it's necessary to wear a mask, and other participants start to agree and ask technical questions that you don't know the answers to. So please take a few minutes to think about how would you respond in this situation? All right, that was the time. And Johnson, just so you know, Allison and Lena are both going to be the CO participants and they're gonna have a little bit of a back and forth conversation. And then they will let you know when they're finished and turn it over to you to respond as the CO provider. So Johnson, are you, I see you're on. All right, Allison and Lena, do you want to take it away? So, Johnson, I do have a quick question. Um, speaking of U.S. laws, I don't know if we need to wear a mask anymore. Um, they keep changing their minds about whether a mask helps or not. And now they've said that people don't need to wear them anymore. Okay. Uh, first of all, Allison, I would like to... Thank you so much for your question. It is a very good question. And as you all know that uh, after the COVID-19 uh, breakout, there has been a lot of information out there. Uh, some of it is correct and some of it it is not correct. So I can say some of it is accurate and other information is not accurate. Uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, I am not the center of all information and knowledge. So there are some things that uh, I, might, I might not know them, but what I can do is I can provide you with papers and links uh, which uh, speak about the disease and speak about the importance of wearing masks. And this information is derived from uh, CDC and the WHO. And I believe that uh, after you go through this link and after you go through these documents, you will find some information which will help you uh, to, to, to make your, your decisions. But as of now, uh, we, are, we, are, we are dealing with the US laws we will finish uh, with this uh, topic. And then after that, we'll go back to all the mask related questions. And uh, also if you have any other questions later, please make sure that you ask them so that we can address them together. You are here to learn from me, but I'm also learning from you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I agree. I did hear though, that we don't have to wear masks anymore, which means COVID is over. Again, again, uh, thank you so much for that uh, for for that question. And uh, as I said before, that some of this information is is accurate and some of this information is not accurate. But um, what I can tell you is is that uh, this disease is still there, 
And one of the things that can, can tell you that the, the disease is still out there, people are still getting vaccinated. For instance, in, in, in the United States of America, more than uh, 146 million people have been vaccinated and the vaccination is still, is still taking place uh, and people are still being vaccinated. So this shows that the disease is still there. And uh, it is very important uh, for us to know this. But again, as I said before, I will share this information with you so that you can see the trend of this disease, so that you can see the, uh, the research and the findings which were put forward by different scholars and scientists on the importance of wearing a mask. And then uh, from there, I think you can, uh, you can make a decision for yourself. And as I said before, uh, I have to be honest with you, I might, not, I might not know all the answers, but what I can do is I will share information that will be helpful to you when it comes to decision making. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Johnson. That was very good. Like Gardenia, you guys are top students. Um, and I see people writing good things in the chat. So I'm going to review some of the techniques that Johnson used. You, he did a really good job of normalizing the question. Like you said, that's a really great question. Um, to several of the comments that they made. You talked about how there's a lot of information out of there, some accurate, some not. I loved how honest you were and how you said you're not the source of all the information and you don't know everything, but this is what you do know. Um, and you talked about linking Allison and Lena to further resources. I liked how you referenced where the resources are from, that they're from the CDC and World Health Organization, and that you're talking about um, providing them with the science-based facts so that they can learn on their own. I liked how you encouraged that self-learning because it's really, um, that's also key to any response about the COVID vaccine is ultimately our role is to um, remind or ensure clients of their autonomy and dignity. It is their choice about the vaccine. And um, our role is purely to give them access to resources so that they can make their own choice. Um, and then I liked how you kind of tried to tie it to switch back to the US laws and that you said you offered at the end that together they could go over more questions about the mask um, or ask any other questions they had. Then when Lena and Allison continued asking questions because we were trying to replicate an environment where maybe participants feel very strongly and they don't want to move on to the next section, but they would prefer to keep going over their concerns in the moment. I really liked how you repeated yourself. And this is also one of our key techniques that we would like you to take away from this presentation is it's okay to repeat yourself many times in slightly different ways, such as if clients continue saying, but I heard this myth or this myth or this myth or this myth, for you to continually say, yes, there is a lot of information out, of, out there. A lot of it is not accurate. What I can do is point you towards some scientifically based resources. Here they are that will address these questions that you can use to make your own decision about the vaccine. I also liked how you, um, you didn't repeat the myth that COVID is over, which is really good, but you did address it by saying that the disease is still out there and you threw in a fact about how many people are still getting vaccinated. And just another tip is that you could also talk about um, how many people are dying from COVID, which is listed in the core FAQ document, to just emphasize that there's still tens of thousands of people dying from COVID around the world. It's, um, it is still here and that being vaccinated is one good way to protect ourselves and others, and especially those who haven't had a chance to get vaccinated yet, such as children or those with compromised immune systems. So I think you did wonderful, Johnson and Gardenia, and thank you both for volunteering your time with us. I'll now turn it back to Jamie for the Q&A.
Great. Uh, yeah, a huge thank you again uh, for the volunteers. Um, hopefully that was informative. Uh, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but we are going to share the PowerPoint. We also have a worksheet that has all these scenarios and has the North Tip. So after uh, this, if you have colleagues that you want to do and practice more of these scenarios, you can do the same thing. So really um, appreciate that. So we're going to move into the uh, question and answer portion. And we have a for questions, um, please feel free to put other questions in and also um, use the upvote um, uh, feature so that we know which ones are your top uh, concerns. So the first one actually that I'm going to ask is, um, you know, a lot of how to respond to mixing of vaccines, especially if they took one dose. Yes, this is a question that has come up. Um, especially if they've had a vaccine in one place and then they go to another place, the best thing to do is to talk to, to to advise them to talk to a medical provider once they're in the U.S. because only the medical provider can answer depending on you know when they had the doses and where what they should do in terms of their second dose. Great. Um, the other question we have, uh, this is more of a comment, um, but if you have some further tips, the mm -hmm. not believing COVID is real is uh, a huge um, kind of concern. Um, and so any additional tips that you guys might have on uh, handling that situation? For that situation, again, I would not as Johnson did really well with his role play, the key is to not repeat that when the client is saying, I don't think COVID is real. And instead to emphasize again, that there's just a lot of information out there. Some of it is factual. A lot of it is not that there are people who are specifically trying to spread misinformation to try to create issues. Um, in society and that what we do know is that many, many people have been infected, tens of thousands have died and that it's also caused very serious side effects, uh, long-term side effects in people and their health and that it's really important to get all the facts from a trusted, credible source. And if the client is interested, you can point them towards those trusted, credible sources. Um, so this was a question earlier on, and I know that we covered sort of the CO provider role uh, around to give information is not to, and it's not to convince people um, to yeah. become vaccinated. But we did have a question of uh, interest in knowing what approach is more effective to getting more people to get vaccinated. Um, so I don't know if you care to comment on that. That is a good question, Deborah, because um, ultimately we are hoping that people will decide that they want to get the vaccine. Again, our role when we're meeting with any clients, no matter if you're a CO provider, case manager, employment specialist, it's definitely not to tell the client to get a vaccine and to emphasize that it's their own choice and to affirm their agency and dignity. That being said, our case managers have found that it is very effective to just be honest with clients. And if you feel comfortable and if you've gotten the vaccine yourself to share, you know, it is a personal choice. I did personally choose to get the vaccine and here are my reasons why. Many of our case managers have found that actually a lot of People who are hesitant about the vaccine are hesitant because they feel like they don't know anyone who's gotten the vaccine themselves and they're worried about the side effects and they just don't know what to experience. And then when they find out that some case managers they know have gotten the vaccine and they're able to ask them questions about their experience, like were the side effects as bad as everyone says they're going to be, et cetera that that actually has been quite effective in convincing people that they themselves should get the vaccine. Allison and Lena, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, 
On my end, I, I think um, I think you covered that really well. Uh, great. So the another question we have is, do we need to mention specific state regulations regarding mask wearing? Um, so this is a, a actually a good question because I know in the role play, mm -hmm. uh, Johnson, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're from RSC Africa. So you were probably putting on your um, your overseas hat in terms of answering that question. But this uh, Salsa is from IRC Baltimore, I believe. So she's got a domestic perspective. So it's a, actually a really great question. Yes, thank you for asking that. We did mean to bring it up that at the when you're offering to point them towards more resources, you could point them towards what the state guidelines are regarding masks. And it, it would be good as part of your role to try to stay up to date on what are the regulations within that state around the masks. Um, and I think we even, like if you have a way to print them out or to just keep them accessible to give to clients too, that would be good. And then also just referencing with clients and validating that it is really confusing, the different mask guidelines. It is not uniform, even within the same area, like where I live, some of the businesses are still requiring masks, others highly encourage them, others, they don't require a mask and just acknowledging for clients that yes, it is very confusing. They are not the only ones who are confused. And the best thing they can do is to try to keep up to date on what the current regulations are. And in your role as CO provider, you can help them keep up to date. Great. Um, another, uh, we're getting all these uh, extra scenarios, which is great. So Doha ask, um, sometimes the client will say, I don't need a vaccine because I'm healthy. Um, mm -hmm. Any tips for responding to that particular um, point? Yes, we have also heard that question a lot, of, especially with younger populations. It is true they are healthy, and usually when they get COVID, their symptoms aren't as severe as, say, the elderly population. What you can say when someone says, I don't need the vaccine, I'm healthy, I'm young, um, I don't have any medical issues, why should I get it? You can talk, you can highlight two different aspects. One is that while yes, the majority of people who get COVID who are in a, if say they're young or healthy, they might not have any side effects. There is still that small percentage who do have very negative side effects from COVID, even if they are healthy and young. Um, and is that a risk that they're willing to take to maybe be in that small percentage of otherwise healthy people who end up having really serious issues from COVID and potentially dying versus getting a vaccine and having maybe very mild side effects and then um, you know, having better protection against COVID? The second aspect to highlight that, again, our, like we've heard from case managers has been quite effective with clients is emphasizing this idea of community and that when you get a vaccine, you're not only protecting yourself, like you yourself might be healthy, but you're protecting everyone around you. Like, do you have an elderly parent? Do you have children? Do you have friends who have medical conditions? Like, by getting yourself vaccinated, you are helping to protect everyone around you who might, if they get COVID, end up getting very sick and dying. And so it's just something you can do. Like we've talked, like clients have talked about, it's out of love, it's out of hope like to get vaccinated. And then another point is the more people who get vaccinated, the more we can return back to normal. Like we can't go back to normal as a society and do normal things and hang out with our families and go places until enough people have been vaccinated. So if they get vaccinated, they're helping us return to normal. Um, so a question from Caroline is, suppose someone asks, which is the best vaccine for myself and my family? How do you answer that? And mm -hmm. I'll put another caveat on this, uh, particularly because uh, we have uh, people overseas, and I know the vaccines that are overseas that are available might vary from what's in the U.S., so I'm going to add that little detail in there. Yes, thank you, Jamie. This is also, 
yes, we've heard this question a lot. And we've also heard from clients and case managers that clients know which vaccines certain people have received and then want that vaccine, such as here in the U.S. A lot of people know what vaccine Dr. Fauci received and what the president received, and then they want that same vaccine. Again, if someone asks you, you know, what's the best vaccine for myself and my family, you can respond and just be very honest with like, it's um, your role is to help point them towards resources. You cannot advise them on which vaccine to get. But what you can say is that at least in the U.S., um, in the U.S. context, all of the vaccines that are available have gone through extensive testing and trials and are very closely monitored for safety. And they have all been found to be effective against COVID and safe. And then if the client keeps pushing you for more information, um, ultimately, this is a question for their medical provider if they really do feel like they want to talk with someone about what the best vaccine is. In the U.S. context, they're, all the vaccines are equally good. But again, if the client is continually pushing, it's ultimately a question for their medical provider. Great. Um, really, we have, uh, we'll, I think we still have five more minutes for questions. Sarah, you're doing a great job. So Thanks. the next question we have is how will, as a CO provider, I, I as a CO provider address the question that some people have died after taking the vaccine. Is it 100% safe? Again, this is a good question. And I think it differs between whether you are maybe answering questions um, to someone who's in the U.S. and talking about U.S. vaccines or not. But again, especially in the U.S. context, you can talk about how the currently approved vaccines, you know, they've been tested on tens of thousands of people from different ethnicities, ages, health conditions to purposely, you know, test out how they react with different groups. They've met the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's high scientific standards for safety, effectiveness, and manufacturing. And that, you know, you can check with the core FAQ document to see the updated numbers. But as of June 6, 298 million doses of COVID vaccines have been administered in the U.S. alone, much less around the world. And that just around the world, the vaccine safety is being closely monitored. Um, and so just that these, it's very, very safe and that if they are worried, you can point them towards more resources. Like it's not, it's not within your role to have to convince them that it's safe. You can give some of the facts and then you can say, let me point you to more resources so you can do some research. And then a follow-up uh, to this question, uh, I guess, is along the, and these are, we're getting into the more of the technical question, which I think mm -hmm. it goes back to that North, like stay within your knowledge mm -hmm. base. And, um, but the other question we have is uh, what about, you know, how to answer questions about unknown possible long-term side effects of the vaccine as a reason not to get it. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a good one that we've been hearing a lot. And so as Jamie mentioned, you know, if it starts getting too technical, so some of these questions we do review in the core FAQ document. So if you have it up and you have it handy and you feel comfortable, you could address some of these technicalities. And if you are choosing to address the technicalities, um, you can talk about how they've been using the vaccine since last August, like trialing them. And so we have a pretty good sense now of any possible long-term side effects. And you know, what we do know is that the long-term side effects of COVID, getting actually sick with COVID, have been well documented at this point, even for people who um, were healthy or who didn't really have symptoms of COVID, they're starting to have long-term health issues that they're linking back to COVID. If you don't feel comfortable answering this question about, you know, what are the possible long-term side effects, you again can reference and be honest that um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, 
and that you can point them towards some credible sources that talk more about the long-term side effects of the vaccine. Great. And I just pulled on the screen as Sarah was answering the COVID FAQ. So again, really would encourage everybody to go back and read through. We only covered a couple of those questions today. Um, now we've covered several more uh, with Sarah. And then also the translated resources page, because the FAQ we've updated, um, but NRC RIM is also always creating um, resources. I believe you guys just have a, a new video, animated video about side effects for um, or what happens after you get vaccinated. Is that, that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I definitely, if you haven't, um, please, you know, so you can also sign up for the newsletter um, for NRC RIM, because that's another great way to get more resources on this area. Um, so we have a, a last question and then we'll transition to wrap up, which is, um, and actually this is, uh, this is, I this is a good question. There are many diseases that we're facing for a long time and no one found a vaccine for them, but for COVID, it became available in a year. How can it be safe? I know you guys, I think you've heard this one quite a bit. Oh yes, this is another good one that we've heard a lot. So thank you, Omar, for bringing it up. To answer this question, um, yes, there are lots of different diseases that do not have vaccines for them. But the thing with the COVID vaccine is, so COVID is caused by something called a coronavirus, and there are lots of different types of coronaviruses. And so scientists have been studying them for many, many years. And because of this, scientists know a lot about coronaviruses. They have a lot of previous research that they pulled on and they used to develop the vaccine. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like COVID was brand new. We already knew a lot about coronaviruses in general. So they were able to adapt that to COVID. In addition, the reason why it happened it seemingly quickly is because the government funded many, many companies to work on developing and testing the vaccine at the same time. So it was a concentrated effort of people trying to develop the vaccine versus with other vaccine. It's vaccines, it's one company working on it, on one vaccine and another one and another one. And then when a vaccine is normally made, it gets tested first before they start producing large amounts of the vaccine. But because of the nature, you know, the urgent nature of the pandemic and the funding from different governments, scientists were able to do both of these at the same time. They were able to both test and mass produce. Um, and all of this allowed the vaccine to be developed much faster than usual. And so again, you can just, you can say all this if you feel comfortable to the client. It's one of the questions we have in our core FAQs that you can read through. And then just emphasize again with the client who's asking that, you know, all, only vaccines that were tested and proven to be safe were approved for use. Like there were lots of vaccines that were made and tested, but they were not all approved. Only the ones that were tested and proven to be safe were approved. And then if the client wants more information, like more of the nitty gritty about how they go through the process of making and testing vaccines, you can point them to different resources. Um, and they have quite a few in different languages. Um, specifically about how can the vaccine and antibody studies move so quickly and still be safe. They have that in a lot of languages because we've been hearing that question a lot. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, Allison, and Lena. We have just five, uh, four more minutes. So the last, we're going to do a couple last things with the group. We want to revisit the question we asked at the beginning, which is, I am confident answering questions about the COVID-19 vaccine during cultural orientation on a scale of one to four. Five, one being not very confident, five being very confident. We're going to go ahead and open that poll, and we'd like you guys to respond again to this question about your confidence level. Um, and so we're going to give a moment for you guys to do that. Let's go ahead and close the poll and share results. So we do have um, a, many people are four and five. We still have some people at one, two, and three, which is totally fine. Uh, because as I said, there's a lot of resources. So we really hope that you'll continue learning after today's session and going back um, into um, this, this recording, but also the COVID-19 FAQ page and also the translated materials library 
and the Get the Facts uh, campaign. Uh, so the in term, I kind of alluded to these next steps. So the next steps are uh, the first thing is we're going to put in the chat box um, a link to a survey um, so that you guys can give us feedback on today's webinar. Um, but we also, as we said, we want you to continue to review and access the shared resources. We want you to practice with others. So as I said, we've created a worksheet that will post with the recording on the learning platform so you can go back and kind of practice with others. Um, and we want you to be on the lookout for that email once that comes in. So it's going to be a couple days because um, we'll go. We are doing the session again this afternoon. Um, we'll post one of those recording sessions, um, and then we'll also um, share all these resources. Um, so with that, I'm going to give you guys a minute, um, the last minute, to complete the survey, which Manar has put into the um, chat box. Uh, if you guys can please uh, complete that, that would be great. And I want to say a big thank you to um, Sarah, Allison, and Lena for their support in putting together this webinar. And also a big thank you to all of your engagement, great participation, and um, a shout out to Gardenia and Johnson for being great volunteers. So with that, thank you so much. Um, we'll stay on the line for another minute while you guys complete the survey um, and have a great rest of your day and rest of your week.